this video, I am going after a very interesting and challenging reflection nebula, NGC 1333, the embryo nebula in the constellation of Perseus. Its reported magnitude is somewhere around 10 to 11 depending on sources, and being a reflection nebula, it is not easy to image it from the light polluted skies here in Yokohama. The reference photo I am displaying was taken at the University of Arizona with a 24-inch Ritchie Krejcian Optical Systems Telescope in 2009. I do not know the exposure time, but this professional image shows the unique and beautiful complexity of this well-studied nebula region. Being less than 10 arc minutes in size, I needed all the magnification I could get, so I uncovered my monster refractor. Take that, Dylan O'Donnell. Mine is bigger than yours. Well, maybe not. Here is the actual scope that I used, mounted on my ZWO AM5 mount. I collected seven and a half hours of data over two nights, on New Year's Eve and January 2nd, in my backyard in Japan. At this time of the year, the embryo nebula transverses the meridian very near to the zenith from my location at latitude 35 degrees north. And on these nights, there was no moon to contend with during the imaging. So let's dive in. Here is the processed image. I cropped it a bit to eliminate some edge artifacts, and frankly, I had to work hard to stretch and enhance the colors to bring out some of the dim details. Also, admittedly, I applied a lot of denoise to clean it up. Here is a little closer look with the icons of the processing software I used displayed in the upper left. If you didn't notice previously, the camera on this and other imaging runs in this video was the ASI 585 MC Color Planetary Camera. Its pixel size is fairly small at 2.9 microns, which I hoped would give me a little better resolution. The field of view of this rig configuration is 1.42 by 0.8 arc degrees of sky. Under OK seeing conditions, the IMX585 sensor is a great match for this optical tube assembly. To obtain this image, I used a UVIR cut filter 180 second exposures, and captured 150 good images that I used for stacking in Deep Sky Stacker. Considering the challenges, I was quite pleased with this image. I guess my expectations were much lower. It was pretty good, but I knew that I could do better. So a few weeks later, the opportunity presented itself for a road trip to darker skies. I went with my friend Junichi. Actually, you may have met him before in Astrophotography Japan Episode 4, published way back in June 2022. Our schedules aligned on Wednesday, January 22nd, and we decided to visit Lake Tanzawa in the foothills of Mount Fuji. It was a bit of a gamble. The weather forecast called for intermittent clouds and heavy cloud cover later in the evening, but we were free and motivated and curious about the location so we left in the early afternoon with plenty of time to explore. On the left of this map, you can see Mount Fuji, and on the right is Yokohama, where I live. Lake Tanzawa is located in the foothills of Mount Fuji, but much less developed and much less known than the famous neighboring lakes of Kawaguchiko and Yamanakako. Junichi picked me up and drove his car, which took less than an hour and a half to reach the lake area. This mountainous area is very rural, with rivers and steep hills and heavy vegetation, but is not high enough to get much snow in the wintertime, especially since it is on the eastern side of the Japan mountain ridges. However, the colder temperatures are a deterrent to most, so even beautiful lake towns like those around Lake Tanzawa are pretty much shut down for the winter months. Restaurants are closed, towns look deserted, traffic is light. But for astrophotography, these conditions are actually ideal compared to the busy summer months. The lake is artificial, a consequence of a dam called the Miho Dam, which was completed in 1978 after nine years of construction. 
From the images, you can probably see that most of the shoreline rises steeply, so there are not really any beaches or casual swimming areas. Boating, water sports, and fishing, however, are quite popular. This trip was partially a reconnaissance mission. We never visited here before, and hence we had no idea if there were any good spots to set up a telescope for deep sky imaging. The skies at the lake were Bortle Class 4, so there was good potential, but we needed to drive around and find suitable imaging sites. As you can see, there are three sections of this lake, and each is rather narrow with steeply rising mountains on all sides. So it quickly became clear that Lake Tanzawa was mostly good for targets high in the sky. Views of Polaris at 35 degrees altitude were often blocked depending on which side of the lake you were on. We found four potential imaging sites indicated here by the yellow arrows. This site was mostly good for the east and south. This site had some convenient bathroom facilities, but was a bit narrow. However, again, east and south were possible. This site was excellent. It was a parking lot right in the middle of the valley, but we were uncertain whether the lights would be on during the evening or night. And believe it or not, we could not find a single person to ask. Even the police box was empty, except for a hotline telephone. FYI, in retrospect, the lights were not on, so it would have been a very good imaging site. This parking lot, part of a closed-up seasonal liquor store, seemed to have good views to the east, south, and west. It was a little close to the streetlights, however, but for various reasons, we chose this location to set up our equipment. In the foreground here is the same imaging rig that I showed you earlier in my backyard. In addition, you can see my ZWO Seastar S30, which I received literally only a few days prior. The tripods and scopes in the back are Junichi's equipment. The sharply rising hills and lake are visible in the background. At this location, Polaris was just barely visible above the mountains in front of us so I could do a classical polar alignment against the celestial north pole with my ASI Air Plus computer. After focusing on a bright star using a Batonoff mask, I then immediately went to NGC 1333, the Embryo Nebula. In this image, I think the sky glow in the background is probably Odawara, which is only about 25 or 30 kilometers away on Sagami Bay. At this time, my target was already close to the meridian and only about one hour prior to the meridian flip. On this evening, Junichi had the idea to image the Io moon transit across Jupiter, so he struggled with a 5x Barlow lens and high magnification equipment configurations. I think he surmised the cold and clear mountain air would offer higher resolution views of the planets for more detailed imaging. And you will see, he was not wrong. Here is the image of Jupiter he took during the transit using the equipment listed here. That is far better than any Jupiter photo I ever captured. This is the image I captured of the Embryo Nebula on the shores of Lake Tanzawa. I managed to get only about 44 good subframes, or 132 minutes of total integration time. The data was much easier to process than the data taken in Yokohama, and the colors were significantly more vibrant under these darker skies. This is an overlay of the Yokohama image that I took earlier. If you recall, it included seven and a half hours of integration time, but it was cropped a little bit as well. The framing is a little bit smaller. But if we zoom, and compare the nebula images, you can see quite a remarkable difference. Notice in the image on the left that the color and details appear much more pronounced, whereas on the right, the colors are somewhat washed out and shapes are more flat or even geometric, which is clearly a denoise blending artifact. Remember, both of these images were taken with the same imaging rig and camera, 
the ASI 585MC color camera. So any differences you see are very likely due to different sky conditions. In both cases, guiding was good, so I'm sure the sky conditions are responsible. I captured all the subframes between 6.09 and 8.47 p.m. And for some of that time, we were dodging clouds. Unfortunately, I forgot to get a snapshot of the medio blue forecast earlier that afternoon. But what you can see from about 2 a.m. and later, that the visibility was very good. Mostly less than 1.5 arc seconds resolution was forecasted. In Yokohama and Tokyo, our typical winter skies are usually 2.5 to 3.5 arc seconds resolution, as reported by Meteo Blue. So I am quite certain the dark and cold and clear and stable mountain air helped to improve the quality of the subframe images and my overall result. Also take notice, I am comparing only 132 minutes of integrated data from Lake Tanzawa to 450 minutes of integrated data taken in Yokohama. At this point you might be wondering, so what about the Sea Star? Well, I also focused the S30 on the Embryo Nebula as well, but much to my dismay, I was only able to capture 84 good 20 second images. That's a total of 28 minutes of integration time. The reason for this has to do with the Sea Star Alt As tracking. If you recall, the Embryo Nebula passed close to the zenith during my imaging time. It transited at 8.12 p.m. at about 73 degrees altitude on this date. This position offers great sky darkness and sky clarity and is wonderful for my imaging with the ADED telescope on the equatorial mount, but my sea star could not track the target at this altitude. It kept failing in the stacking operation due to star trails. This is a common problem with all Altaz tracking equipment. The high altitude sky position near to the zenith is particularly troublesome for the device mechanics. In fact, my last good subframe was at 67 degrees altitude. After that, the images were useless. This is rather concerning. I hope this is not typical of the Seastar S30 performance overall. Otherwise, a significant part of the night sky is off limits, and that would be a bummer. Here is the ED80 field of view superimposed on the Sea Star image. So this gives you an idea of the sky coverage by these focal length and sensor combinations. It's impressive that the Sea Star could capture signal from this dim nebula and I do wonder what a longer exposure time would look like, but due to the tracking issues, that was not possible. This is a zoomed comparison with my ADED image on the left and the Seastar S30 on the right, just for fun. The Embryo Nebula is shown here in a very wide field view, covering about 5 degrees of sky along each side. This reflection nebula is located in a region on the lower side of the Perseus constellation that is extremely rich in dark nebulae. Unfortunately, I do not have skies adequately dark, apertures big enough, or imaging times long enough to pick up these darker nebulae filaments in my images. But perhaps someday. This nebula is only about 1,000 light years away and one of the most highly studied in our galaxy. It contains X-ray sources, brown dwarf stars, and at least 45 herbig harrow objects, which are jets of ionized gas that are ejected from very young stars, like those commonly found in stellar nursery regions. The URL at the bottom is a great reference for showing all the HH objects around this nebula. This is one last look at my two images from Bortle Class 7 skies in Yokohama and Class 4 skies in the Japanese mountains compared to a professional quality image. I like doing these experimental image comparisons between data collected with single variables, like filters, cameras, imaging locations, or other aspects. 
I think it is educational and it explores the factors and limitations that influence my astrophotography results. In Japan, I'm JP Astro Guy. My name is Paul Cheesegel, and thanks for coming along on this imaging travel adventure to Lake Tanzawa. <laughs>